We're going to be in Exodus chapter 34, if you didn't know that already. Exodus chapter 34, and we're going to be, we're going to pick up where we left off from last time, which is what I try to do. But sometimes I backtrack. I'm going to try not to do that, but I will just a little bit. Is that an oxymoron? Is that, is that not right? So we're in Exodus 34, and, and uh, just while you're turning there, just kind of the, hopefully to get us back on, on the same page, on the same level, ground zero, where we left off last week, we were still on the mountain in this meeting with God that's in regards to the restoration of the children of Israel because, if you remember, of the broken fellowship they had with him because of what? The sin, namely, the golden... Right? The golden calf. So, and it's the sin in the camp. So, kind of, that's kind of, in a nutshell, where we're at. We're still on the mountain. The only people on the mountain at this point are Moses and God. If you remember from last week, he, God instructed them to carve the uh, rocks out of the... I'm getting a stop. Stop. Collaborate and listen. Sorry. I'm just trying to add... They forgot to push record. All right, guys. <laughs> Sound effects. Okay. Oh, yay, everybody. Welcome. Good evening. <laughs> well, thank you. We're, th we're glad you're somebody's back there. Thank you so much. We all need help. Amen? Okay, so anyways, we left off last week. We're still on the mountain with Moses. The only two people on the mountain right now at this point are Moses and God. Moses has brought the new um, blanks of the Ten Commandments up on the top of the mountain with them. And so where, we're le where we left at from last week is we're still having this interchange with God. If you remember where we left off like exactly last week, God had just revealed himself in a powerful, mighty way to Moses. And to me, it was a mind blower. It was a, it was a life changer, and it was a, it was a life changer. It was and is going to be a life changer in the life of Moses, as we're going to see. But God revealed himself to Moses, and the way that he did it wasn't in body, if you remember. It was in character. It was in his name and the character that he was. So the way God wanted to reveal himself to Moses and to us is through his name, and he told us his name, and he defined, if you remember, last week, what his name was, what that all meant, what that entailed, who he is. So before we move on, I want to remind you of something, that though this revelation of the name of God is amazing, it's awesome, and really it's an intimate revelation of God, and it's really exclusive. It's funny, because even saying that out loud, I think it is, it's, it's exclusive to anyone who will pick up a Bible and read. You, you know what I'm saying? It, it is exclusive, and it is narrow, and it is to a certain people, but it's not excluding anyone, really. If you'll pick your Bible up and figure out who God is, he said it himself. This is what I'm like. Anyways, so we saw this, it was intimate, it was personal, it was exclusive, God and Moses, it was God describing himself, but we have something better than what Moses has, what Moses had. We have something better than the revelation that Moses received, even though we have that written. But we have the name of God, and the name of God is... I mean, it's Yahweh, it's Jehovah. Um, you could say Yahweh if you wanted to. But, but that's the closest, most accurate that the scholars, that the, that the Jewish scribes can say is that it's something about, it's something like Yahweh. And you can't really top that except, to me, there's another name that's equally as good, and that is the Hebrew name Yeshua. So Yahweh is the name of God, and Yeshua is the name of who? It's Jesus. And Yeshua means not just God, but it means God is salvation. It doesn't get better than that to me. 
I'm going, that is exactly right. That's what we need. And in Hebrews, if you turn to Hebrews and you look at Hebrews and you read through Hebrews, you find the, the theme of Hebrews, the author saying that Jesus is better than this. Jesus is better than the priesthood. Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than the law. And he shows and he lays it out. Jesus is better. Jesus is best. But in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 3, it says, For this one, Jesus, has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. And if you skip down to verse 6, it says, Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence in rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. And the, the writer of Hebrews is saying, there is one better. There is a better way than the way of Moses. And it's through who? Jesus. Jesus, it's through God's way, his chosen way of salvation. God is salvation is through Jesus Christ. And that's his plan. And that was his plan from the beginning. His beautiful gospel, good news, plan of love to a sinner like me. That I had no hope until Jesus, until God became salvation. Amen? And in John... This is the one for me that sums it up. In John chapter 14, verse 8, we see this little scene, and this is our revelation. This is better than, than the revelation of the Old Testament. And it's in John chapter 14, verse 8. And Philip says to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. And probably a whole lot of you are clicking in your head. I know what's coming next. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? Jesus said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. We have a better revelation, and it's Jesus Christ. Amen? You guys with me? We all on the same page? It was cool to see that passing of the glory from Moses, but we have... God who became flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And they called His name Emmanuel. God with us. I love the name Emmanuel. God with us. That's what we need. We need Him. We need you here, Lord. Be with us. So all that to say, we, what we have in Christ is far superior to what Moses had. It's the finished work. The finished work. I'm going to repeat that one more time. The what kind of work? Finished work of the cross. Finished. Thank you, Lord. Okay, so uh, going into our text, let's go to, to chapter Exodus chapter 34. And I have to go back just a little bit. Let's start in verse 6, halfway through verse 6. And, and this is the Lord. The Lord passed before him. The Lord proclaimed. We've got to read this one more time. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. And this is where we left off in verse 8. And, and Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth, and Moses worshipped. So at the revelation of who God is, Moses falls flat on his face and he worships God. An awesome thing. And if you missed that study, um, I'd recommend checking that out. It, it is just an awesome thing. And it's, it's, I think as far as I know, it's the only place in the Old Testament where God said, I'm going to describe to you who I am. Good stuff. And Moses worships, verse 9. And then he said... If now I have found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us. Still requesting. Moses is still requesting. We want your presence in our camp with us. We don't want to go without you. And then he says, even though we are a stiff-necked people. And he says, and pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us as your inheritance. I love this prayer for Moses because he uses some of those very words that God used to describe himself to plead once more that he would restore, that God would restore the nation into a right standing with himself. Even that last statement, that God would restore the nation into a right standing with himself 
is, is full of amazing truth. Because the fact of the matter is, there is nothing that we can do in and of ourselves to gain a right standing with God. He has to do the work. There's nothing you can do. There's no good amount of things. There's no number of spiritual mountains or whatever it would be that you could make yourself right with God. He has to do it. He has to give the grace. He has to pardon. He has to forgive. And Moses cries out. Moses falls on that mercy, if you will, and says, God, please restore us to a right standing. So, I just had written in my notes here, before we move on in the study, let's stop for a second and say the same thing. Amen? Let's make sure we're right with God. In the very last words of Moses' prayer there in in verse 9 was to say, uh, Moses says, on behalf of the people, God, take us as your inheritance. We are yours. So I just want to pause for a moment. Let's pray. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for revealing yourself to us. We are, like I said, we're a room full of people who need your grace of people who have iniquities that need to be pardoned. And before we move on, God, we ask for forgiveness, that we would be made right by the blood of Jesus Christ tonight. Lord, so that we could go into deeper places with you and partake of even more of what you have for us, God. Lord, and I cry out on behalf of myself and these people that we would surrender and we would say, we are your inheritance. This world has nothing for us. God, we want you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, so in this next section of the text, God is going to respond to this call by reestablishing and rebuilding the covenant, the broken covenant that the children of Israel had already broken. So verse 10. And he, God said, Behold... I make a covenant before all your people. I will do such marvels as have never been done in all the earth or in any nation. So right off the bat, that gets me excited. God's already done some marvelous things. If you remember back in Egypt, if you remember in the Exodus and the deliverance and the plagues, God's already done some marvelous things. Now God says, now I'm reestablishing this covenant. I'm going to do more awesome things. I'm not done. And so this restart point, the nation of Israel, right after this huge failure, which really we're still in the end of dealing with up on the mountain, this is what this whole meeting is about, but we're in this restoration section and God decides, God decides to renew his covenant founded upon and based upon nothing less than the character of who God is. And that's what we need. Our relationship with him is based on who he is. The fact that we have right standing with him is based on who he is. And I say, thank you, Lord. One thing I want to point out is that in this place of restoration, God doesn't bring up that very, very near past failure. He doesn't bring it up again. God doesn't say, well, you failed, so I'm going to have to tell you this again. Listen to me this time, right? I think sometimes we have, I don't know if anyone's ever been a parent around here, but sometimes you have to reiterate. You have to continue to retell. I know you just blew it. Listen to me, right? And God doesn't do that. You know who's good at pointing our past failures? Our enemy, right? He's good at bringing up our past failures, our, our, our past uh, mistakes. And one commentary said this, when our enemy does remind us, when he reminds you of your past failures, don't argue with him. Never try to defend yourself because he's probably right. Agree. And you could even say, Satan, the truth is it's even worse than you know. I'm a worse sinner than even you think that I am. And you're forgetting a few things. But I want to remind you of something else that you might have forgotten. Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners of whom I am chief. I've been saved. Get out of here! I am who I am. 
by the grace and the work of God and not my own merit. That's the truth, enemy. But God doesn't remind them of their failures to rub their nose in it again. He moves on to the glorious future that they have in him. And he says, moving forward from this failure, I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth nor in any nation. That might be the word for you tonight here in this place. And you might be sitting here tonight having failed last week or last night or this morning or whenever. And you're thinking, you know, how could God take me back? How could God have mercy on me? I'm done. I'm finished. Well, here's God's word to you tonight. If you're willing to admit your failure, which is to agree that you've sinned, and if you're willing to get right with him, the word is this. Don't live in the past, but press on. You're a new creation in Christ. Let's move forward. God has plans for you. And let me just speak one of my favorite verses, probably one dear to all of you. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and hope. And then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me. When you search for me with all your heart, I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I need that. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, for proclaiming to us, I have a plan with you in mind. If that doesn't give us a purpose, if that doesn't give us a hope, I, there's nothing that will, I don't think, for the creator of the universe to say this to us. And then, in verse 10b, the second part there, it says, And all the people among whom you are, shall see the work of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. So he says, I'm going to do this marvelous, amazing, awesome things. And then the second half of that is, and these people that are your neighbors that are around you are going to see it. So God says, I'm going to do all these, but it's not just for your benefit, although it is for your benefit to bless you and to help you, but also for those who are around you, that they will see and they're going to see things happen in your life, and they're going to go, I can't explain that. That was God. Wow. They couldn't have done that on their own. And hopefully, that'll lead people to saying, I want that in my life. I want that. Whatever that, whatever that weird guy has, I need some of that in my life. Whatever that guy, whatever that weird happy man is over there, and that's hopefully who we are. So let's look at verse 11. Then he says, Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I am driving out from before you the Ammonites, I mean the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittite, the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. In verse 12 he says, And take heed to yourself, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you are going, lest it be a snare in your midst. But you shall destroy their altars and break their sacred pillars and cut down their wooden images. So God, he says, observe what I've commanded you. He wants them to, to, to listen, to hear. He wants them to keep this observation. He wants them to do what he's telling them to do. And he says a few things. One of, one of the greatest works that he's going to do in the land, one of the marvelous works is... Going to, he's going to drive out the ungodly Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, and in how he's going to do it is going to be some miraculous things. One of them, he's going to part the Jordan on their way in. If you guys remember the, the story of Jericho, he's going to pull a miracle, and the walls of Jericho, the mighty walls of Jericho, were going to fall down. If you remember the story, he's going to make the sun stand still in the sky at the request of Joshua, at the prayer of Joshua. So he's going to do some marvelous things in bringing them into this land and cleaning this land out. Why? Well, one of the reasons is because at this time in history, the Canaanites and that whole area of Canaan were ripe with sin. And not in a good way of ripe. I mean, maybe rotten fruit. We did a little 
fruit study with the little kids on Sunday morning. And my wife kindly, so kindly brought in a completely rotten banana. And it was funny. One of the little kids was like, what is that? I have no idea what that is. That's an overripe banana. Push it. And he just pushed it and it all came out the end. And he's like, I've never seen that before. So anyways, that's what I think of when I think of the ripeness of the fruit level in Canaan at this time. They're not just missing the mark. They're not just a sinful nation, but they're blatantly uh, flying in the face of God and God's plan. They're worshiping gods by committing horrible sin. And we went over some of those, if you remember. They're committing sexual sin by having sex with temple prostitutes as an act of worship to their false gods. And they're also sacrificing their babies on the arms of Molech and they're worshiping in, in their worship of these false gods. And just horrific things that are completely an abomination. So God says, I'm going to drive them out. And here's what you need to do. Here's your part. I'm going to take care of the big stuff. Even though they're going to, you're, if you remember the story, they're going to go, we can't do it. And they're going to turn back to the wilderness. And Moses says, oy vey, what are you doing to me, Lord? So, but, but he says, this is what I want you to do when I go in, when, you, when I go in, when I deliver, and when I begin to take these people out of the land, if you remember that God is going to drive them, he's already said a few ways. One of them was a hornet. But he says, be careful to observe this. Number one, don't make a covenant with them, or it will be, a, remember what he said? A snare. It'll be a trap to you to make a covenant with these people. The second thing he said, don't leave their idols or their altars in this land. Break them down. Destroy them. Cut them out. Take them down. At the core of what God is saying is this. Don't allow worldly compromise, pagan compromise into your life. Don't bow to what the secular world is bowing to. You keep your life holy. You keep it set apart for me. It's as if God is saying, and if you allow those subtle compromises in your life, really they're not that subtle if you're looking at the children of Israel. But for us, if you allow subtle compromises into your life, God is saying, listen, mark my words. It's a trap. It's a pitfall. It's going to hurt. And isn't that true? You allow, allow a little leaven in, and guess what? The leaven's the whole lump, Right? Verse 14, and this is kind of the progression of it. He says, for you shall worship no other, oh, this isn't it. This is the other, another command. You shall worship no other God for the Lord whose name is jealous, is a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and you play the harlot with their God. So God gives us this, uh, this example, this picture of what it's like when we bow down to other things in life over him. And by definition, that's the same thing. It's a worship thing. It's, a, it's an act of idolatry, worshiping any created thing, whether we created it or whether he created it, Romans says. Worshiping something created over the creator. But he likens this to a marriage relationship. He says, I'm jealous for you. Not of you, like I heard Oprah say one time and just drove me up the wall. God's jealous of me? Well, then I can't believe in God. I'm like, oh my goodness, God is not jealous of you. <laughs> <laughs> but he is jealous for you. He does wish you'd turn to him. He does wish your heart wouldn't be caught up with all these other things. And sometimes we worship ourselves over God. But God is jealous for you. For your heart. And he's got this heart that says, I'm not willing to share you with idols. I don't want to. I don't want to share you with anything. You are mine and I'm yours. Some beautiful pictures of that painted in the Psalm of Solomon. I don't want you to play the harlot. And so what is playing the harlot? Here's a question for you. How many of you married couples would be willing to share your spouse with another person? Maybe for just like 20% of the time. No, right? You're thinking, no, I should punch you, Pastor Isaac, right in the nose for even saying that. I, and I agree. It's on completely unthinkable. 
And it's funny because I was thinking as I'm, as I'm typing this up, I actually had this kid Facebook message my wife and like kind of make a pass at her. <laughs> to which I responded. <laughs> you know, needless to say. Uh, but I just told him, hey man, don't message my wife. And here's a little uh, bit of advice. Don't message anyone's wife. No wives do you message and try to make a pass at. And he apologized, and I returned another response and said, God has a plan for your life, and it's to be a man of honor. It's to be a man of integrity. And it's not to treat women like property, but to have respect for them. And if you would desire, if any of this rings true in your heart, you desire to find that way, I'd love to talk to you. No response. But hey, I'm throwing it out there. God, and that's one of the things that I love about God is, you know, he'll, he'll turn ugly little lumps of clay into something beautiful, into something that stands for something in this world. Amen? And so hopefully, maybe he'll respond one day. Maybe he won't. But one thing he will not be doing, praise God. So one commentary said, this is such an unthinkable thing, but spiritually speaking, it happens all the time. Spiritually speaking, we end up compartmentalizing our lives and saying, I'll give God probably the majority, but I'm going to keep this little spot right over here. That's me. You know, that's, that's for me. And we end up rationalizing, allowing sin or ungodliness to remain in our lives. And so here, verses 15b, here is what this is going to look like. God says, now let me show you, this is what's going to happen if you do compromise and make sacrifice to their gods. And one of them invites you to eat of his sacrifice, and you take of his daughters for your sons, and his daughters play the harlot with their gods, and make your sons play the harlot with their gods. So God shows Israel, this is a progression. This is what can happen. If you allow their idols, if you allow those altars to hang around in your house, and, and I'm praying even now that God will reveal to us some of those things, those worldly things that are hanging out in our lives. If you allow them to stay around in the place where you live, and you give in a little and make little sacrifices for these things, and maybe, maybe for the, the cause of fitting in or just to be one of the guys, you, you give in to some things that you normally wouldn't or that you should know you shouldn't. And then one invites you to come over and eat of his sacrifice, meaning you partake with them and you become unequally yoked in this relationship. This, this compromise is going to lead, God is telling us, to a relationship with sin, with a sinful thing. And that's this part of this jealousy part. And here's one of the things that God tells us at the end of this. To me, it's kind of the kicker, and it, and it plucks on my heartstring. He's kind of saying, and you, you might be strong enough to give in a little bit and still withstand and still live a Christian life and, uh, to some extent, and to not really bow your knee and to not really worship, but to give in enough to fit in, maybe. But he says your children won't be. And this reflects right back to that warning of God to me, right back in verse 7 of this chapter, halfway through, when God says, By no means clearing the guilty and visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. It's like God is saying, if you do these things, it's going to be a curse upon the kids. Don't give in to compromise in your life and have them watch and have them see, and have them think, I can do that, because dad could do it. And it's a pitfall and a sad thing when it happens. Don't bring this upon our kids. Amen? Verse 17. You shall make for yourself, oh yeah, one more thing God's saying, and you shall make for yourself no gods, molded gods for yourself. <clears throat> Golden calf, right. <clears throat> no more idol worship, guys. 
But then God moves on to reiterate some of the things that he's already said before uh, in, in the last time that he made covenant and, and this relationship with the children of Israel. And he starts here with the feasts in verse 18. The feast of unleavened bread, verse 18, you shall keep. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread as I commanded you. And in the appointed time of the month of Abib, for in the month of Abib, you came out of Egypt. So if you guys remember what the feast, I don't know if you do, the feast of unleavened bread, you remember what that was? It, it, was, it starts with the Passover, right? The feast of Passover and unleavened bread are kind of lumped together. And so that, and that it, it refers back to Exodus chapter 22. And it continues on from the Passover to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So the Passover represents the deliverance or the salvation of God to his children, right? You remember that? When God told them that they needed to take that lamb and they needed to kill it, they needed to put the blood over the door, they needed to take it in and boil it and eat it. Or I'm sorry, maybe it was roast it. Roast it and eat it. Maybe it wasn't boil it. We'll have to read that again. But God tells them to do this, and with the ones who had put the blood over the doorposts of their house, remember what happened? God passed by. That angel passed by that was to kill them because of the blood of the Lamb. And that paints a beautiful picture for us. And then the Feast of Unleavened Bread is to represent the purity that we're to walk in after we're delivered. And so there's this awesome memorial, this awesome picture you know, sometimes we tend to get that backwards. Sometimes we think, okay, God, I'll be good. And once I'm good for like a year, then you can deliver me. But that's not the way God works. We got to come to God. We got to surrender to him first. And then he continues this work in us, right? And then he begins to, he, he begins or continues to love us enough not to leave us the way we are, but allows us to change and brings us through things. So verse 19, then he goes on and he says, so we got those, that feast. And he says in verse 19, all that open the womb are mine and every male firstborn among your livestock, whether ox or sheep, but the firstborn of the donkey, you shall redeem with the lamb. And if you will not redeem him, then you shall break his neck. All the firstborn of your sons, you shall redeem and none shall appear before me empty handed. I, I really, again, I have to go back and say, I really like the donkey part. You know, I feel like I fit in really well with the donkey part that I need to be redeemed by the blood of the lamb. And if not, please break my neck and put me out of my misery. Right. I need Jesus in my life. Otherwise, I'm a donkey. I'm a mule. But do you remember why they did this? Do you remember what this was supposed to be? It was supposed to be a memorial. It was the second thing to remind them of what God had done to deliver them that night at Passover. So it's, it's for them to remember. That's what a memorial is. So when their son or daughter asked them, why are we giving this firstborn to God? Or, or maybe they'd say, why are we, you know, sacrificing a lamb for this mule? That the, the fathers would say, this is to remember what God did in saving the firstborn of the children of Israel, passing over them. That once we applied the blood of the lamb to the doorpost, judgment, the judgment of God passed by because our firstborn was covered by that blood. There was still a price. There was still death in place of the firstborn. <laughs> But it was the death of the blood of the lamb, the death of that lamb. And something that I thought, just out of the blue, as I'm reading through this, I was thinking, you know, it'd be easy to forget why this happened and just kind of come across this maybe in our daily reading and think, what, what a weird, gross thing to do. Almost like this is an unfair thing to happen, and I don't really like it. I don't know if I agree with it. Why are we killing these animals? What, what does this even have to do with anything? And I felt like the Lord was saying, we need to remember. Same thing in our lives. When hard things, difficult things happen in our life that we may not understand or even agree with, we need to remember the Word of God in our lives. The words of God like Romans 8.18. 
For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall re- be revealed in us. We need to remember in times we don't understand, in things that seem hard and difficult. First Peter chapter 1, verse 7, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We need to remember Romans 8.28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. What are those things? When we're going through and we, we don't understand something, we need to remember what God has already said. Amen? Verse 21. He says, Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. In plowing time and in harvest, you shall rest. And you shall observe the feast of weeks. Uh, Of the first fruits of wheat harvest. And the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Three times in a year, all your men shall appear before the Lord and the Lord God, I'm sorry, the Lord God of Israel. For I will cast out the nations before you and enlarge your borders. Neither will any man covet your land when you go up to appear before the Lord, your God, three times in the year. So in this, in this section, God gives in verse 21, verse 22, God gives the children of Israel two more observances. <clears throat> and then he reminds them that these three times, these three feasts, you shall observe and you shall, he says, appear before the Lord. God says in verse 23, you're going to basically make a pilgrimage. You're going to leave your homes and you're going to come and you're going to worship. All all you men. And God, knowing that man would begin to say, well, we can't leave all of this stuff. My home, all these these things to go worship three times a year. Our, Our neighboring enemies will catch on. And what's going to happen? They're going to begin to come. They're going to steal our livestock, destroy our crops and our homes. But God tells them, if you honor me, I've got your back. That's a big one. That's a big one. I've got you covered, God says. It's one thing for a a buddy or a human, a person to say, I've got your back. But it's a whole other thing when God says, hey, I've got you covered. That's awesome. I, I think, man, I feel sorry for the guys coming against them, right? If God's on your side, if God's got your back. So God's calling them in this section to do something that's difficult. It's hard for a human to do, to leave the stuff behind and worship God. To, to leave the things that you, that you count valuable in this life to go to something that should be more valuable because it is in regard to the next life and to eternity and to sacrifice for him. There's going to be times, there's going to be instances in our lives where God is calling us to do a hard thing in order to honor him, in order to obey him. And he knows us pretty well. He knows that we're going to begin saying in our mind, yeah, but if I obey God, then this could happen. And then if that happens, then this could happen. And if that happens, then I could lose my job. Or maybe I could lose the relationship with this person. Or whatever it may be. When you're challenged to disobey God's word in order to hang on to things in this world, remember this section of scripture. Remember this word. God says, if you obey me, if you do the difficult thing, I've got your back. Man, that's good. I need to hear that. Amen? He didn't say it'd be easy, but he said he'd be the one to protect us. And the same is true for us. It's funny, when I was writing this, I'm thinking this does pertain to our lives. When I was writing this in my notes, when I was writing this thought down earlier in the week, it just so happened that right as I was writing this sentence, this car pulled up in the parking lot and came in and said, hey, Is that your vehicle for sale? I want to buy it. And I thought, look at God's taking care of me. I'm 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 not trying to go out there and sell this thing. God just says, Hey, you want to do this? I got your back. Yes. 
I'm just telling you, I'll tell you this, honestly, I cannot afford to not have God having my back <laughs> because I don't have it together. Man. I don't even have my front, and you know. <laughs> Lord, man, it was just one of those God winks. I'm with you. I think we need those. Every once in a while, we need a good God wink in our life. I'm here. Verse 25. He says, You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven, nor shall the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover be left until morning. The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God, and you shall not boil a goat in its mother's milk. Back to that one again. So he gives them some more of these instructions that he's already given. Verse 26, the tie, the first fruits to bring to the house of the Lord, to give back to God what he's already given to us. Um, and then in verse 26 at the end there, you shall not boil. And, and if you guys remember, it, you, you, when you first read that, you think, I never would have ever thought to boil a baby goat in his mother's milk. I think I'm clear on that one. Doesn't sound appealing in any way. <laughs> It's one of those ones that was a cultural thing with them. If you remember why they did it, it was a Canaanite pagan fertility ritual done for a kind of success or for prosperity. And God told them not to partake of it. And of course, the weird thing is that turned it into a food law. They said, you can't have meat and you can't have dairy. And the idea was, well, if you have you know, a small piece of goat steak or whatever, I don't know, however you cook goat. If you have that goat and then you drink a little bit of goat's milk, it just might boil that in your stomach because it's warming up and digestion's taking place and they'd be breaking this law. And so now, I mean, the worst, we, we, if you remember when we reviewed, the worst thing that came of this is there are no cheeseburgers in Israel. Some people might not like cheeseburgers. My wife doesn't like cheese on the burger. I think they're missing out. <laughs> so there's a few of those things, you know, that uh, they took it to the top, to the next level. But anyways, and we'll probably get into some more of those later on. Verse 27, And the Lord said to Moses, Write these words, for according to the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So he's reestablished. According to what I'm saying, according to these commandments I'm going to give you, I've reestablished this broken covenant with Israel. So in verse 28, so he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant and the Ten Commandments. So it concludes this time on Mount Sinai. He's just gotten the vision from God. He's received the words from God. He's received the stone tablets from God. And all we can think about is how did he last 40 days and 40 nights without food and water, right? Especially water. I can understand food. It's just funny how our minds go, now that's impossible. Reminds me of a scripture. With man, this is impossible. But with God, how many things? All things are possible. 40 days and 40 nights without water. One of the commentaries I went through said that it, it basically takes nine days without water until you're dead. I'm going to take his word for it. I like water. I don't want to try that. But we've all heard that two or three days and you're in a really bad way. And so here it is. I mean, it's not humanly possible, so it is supernatural. But we do see that God makes this provision. And so, okay, we are, Jesus did say, my disciples will fast, but this is not our model. God never said, don't drink water, and that's how you're going to fast for me. And so this isn't the way that I, I'm going, thank God this is not the instruction of how to fast. But what this is, is a confirmation of the scripture that from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, that Jesus repeated himself that says, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And what we find here in this little testament, this testimony, this little script that kind of baffles our mind, is that God's provision is enough for us. And it's the truth. God, His word, 
He is what we need to sustain us. This is a truth that God wants to remind us of tonight. He is enough. He is more than enough to get us through. And the next verse here is going to be testimony to it in verse 29. Now it was so, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hands, when he came down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. So Moses comes down from this mountain from God, not having eaten for 40 days, not having drank any water for 40 days. And you know, in your mind, you think Moses comes down and he probably whittled a cane and those things are heavy and he's got no food and he's leaning on it going like, help me, you know, I, did, I was up there the whole time. Moses comes down fully charged and radiating, revived from being in the presence of God. <sighs> I'm going, Yes! He didn't even know it. If you look at that verse, he didn't even know. It's almost as if he was kind of so caught up being in the presence of God that he didn't know that that encounter had changed his countenance. I'm thinking, shouldn't that be the truth in our relationship with God? I mean, is it true or false that people that have a close walk with God look different? It's true. It's true. Now, the shine wasn't coming from Moses himself. It was really from God, and it, and it radiated into Moses, but it was from God, and it was from Moses spending time with God, and then this radiating back out of him. It was a, a reflection, if you will. And I think to myself, man, how we need to be caught up in the presence of God. The simple fact of the matter is that we spend time with God, it should change our demeanor. It should change our face. Our face should show for it. Now, has anyone ever, after conversion, after giving your heart to the Lord and having his joy and his spirit fill your life, has anyone ever had testimony to that? Has someone ever said, you, what, you're, what's, either what's wrong with you, or you just look different? Anybody ever had that? Anybody say testimony to that? Okay, well, I will. I had that. My aunt was going, I don't know what... My nickname in high school was Moose. So she goes, Moose, I don't know what's wrong with you, but you're just like full of joy. I'm like, yeah, God, I have a relationship with the creator. So, and it should, and it should be different in our face. But maybe not like Moses. Maybe, maybe we won't be glowing, but it should at least have the underlying look of we should have, our face should have the underlying look of the peace of God, the underlying look of the joy of God and his salvation. I mean, the gospel is called good news for a reason. I was going to hell, people, and now I'm going to heaven because of his goodness. I'm happy. I'm joyous. I have the joy of my salvation. So it should be. This should be. It should be like, and I thought, I thought of this. You remember that old drug ad that said, this is your brain? This is your brain on drugs and I cracked the egg in the frying pan? Any questions? I was thinking, this, this is your face. This is your face on the joy of your salvation, right? It should just be bah, beaming. <laughs> we shouldn't have that mean, mad, scowling Christian look. You ever met the Christian that had it, that just kind of looked at you like, <laughs> almost like, I don't know why you're here, you sinner, you know? Or maybe a Sunday school teacher that's just kind of like, and I pray for our Sunday school teachers that have to deal with our children. <laughs> <laughs> we shouldn't have that. We should have the joy of the Lord on our face, amen? We need to be that light. We need to be that salt, that difference. Being that light kind of takes a whole other uh, meaning when you think of Moses and the light coming out of him, right? Verse 30. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face had shown they were what? They were afraid to come near. Don't blame them. Verse 31. Then Moses called to them and Aaron and to the rulers of the congregation. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, he called Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him and Moses talked with them. And then verse 32, after all the children of Israel had come near, he gave them as commands 
all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. So the response from the children of Israel immediately was to be afraid, and, and they went away from Moses. But Moses didn't separate. You know, he didn't have the attitude like, well, yes, you should leave because I've been with the Lord. And I hear from the Lord and you don't. He didn't have any attitude like that. He did what a good leader would do. He brought the people. He called and said, don't be afraid. Come here. Let's talk. And he revealed, he relayed the information that God had given him to them. One of the commentaries I went through, I thought it was funny. They said, you know, it, it, it just catches my attention that Moses was this humble man and and he came down and he didn't even notice. He was so captivated with God and he comes down and he doesn't even know that he's radiating this glow from him. And he said, I feel like in our modern day and age, if one of us was up there, we would be taking selfies before we even came down off the mountain, posting, look at, you know, whoo, look at my glow, what's up? Probably duck face. <laughs> Whatever. But Moses isn't trying to like rub it in anybody. He's not saying, look at me. He's humble. He's humble, and he's saying, this is what God wants for us. So he gets down from the mountain, and he brings the people in. To me, I mean, it, we all have mountaintop experiences with the Lord, and we want them. Hopefully, we'll have more of them. But what happens after? You go down, and you begin to do what God's called you to do. And that's what Moses does. He comes down, humble man, brings the people together. And then verse 33, when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out, and he would come out and he would s and speak to the children of Israel wherever he had been com whatever he had been commanded. And, and whenever the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, then Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went to speak with him. So we see that Moses would cover his face whenever he was with the people, and he would uncover his face whenever he was with God. And you kind of wonder, like, what was that all about? Maybe you might have the thought, like, he wanted to recharge his face with God, maybe put one of those sun tanning things around, you know, and get as much radiation and then keep it in for himself and not share it with the people. But really, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 Verse 13 tells us really why, the commentary on why. And it says, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3.13, Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. Moses wanted to put the veil on because he didn't want the people to see when the glory was fading from his life. I mean, one of the one of the the obvious you can tell by the people being scared effects of this glow was that the people knew my leader just spent time with God. How can you tell? Look at him, right? He's like an incandescent light bulb. Look at this guy. What's that? No, I'm just kidding. So, so here we have this, but Moses is putting this veil on because he's saying this glory was fading and it was. It would kind of go something like this. You know, you're walking by a guy and you say, hey, did you see Moses today? Yeah. Well, what did he look like? Well, it looked pretty good, but man, you should have seen him yesterday. He was glowing, right? So you can kind of see this mentality. He was really shining. Today, he's a little faded, you know, that kind of thing. And so Moses is covering this. And I think about it and I say, you know, we, in a sense, we are to be like Moses, we are to be a reflection of Jesus wherever we go. We are to exude who he is, but we have something better because a greater than Moses has come. And why do I say that? Because Jesus. He came, he saved us, he washed us of our sin. And if you remember right, the veil was torn in two. And now... We don't just have access into the holy place of God. We have the Holy Spirit alive in us. We are the bulb. Moses wasn't. Moses was one of those, 
you know, glow in the dark stickers. You got to put it up to the light, and then he still glows a little bit. And then when it gets too dark, you, know, you fall asleep, and the stars on your ceiling are gone. If you remember those, anybody have stars in a galaxy on their ceiling when they were a kid? I did not. I wanted one. My cousin had it. It was so cool. But anyways, <laughs> Moses' glory fades, and and what what God has given us in the Holy Spirit is a light that continues on, that burns inside, that shines. It's that that spring of living water. That we have the answer. We have the satisfaction with the Holy Spirit living in us. So we don't just radiate something that we've absorbed. Absorbed, excuse me. We, we also have him in us. And you know, at the end of it, that little section there in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, in verse 18, Paul makes it a little bit more clear. He says, but we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. Man, we have it. We have the answer. I guess so the, the call on our lives is that we would continue to allow His Spirit and His presence to be in our life that we would be different. That like Moses, we'd be transformed. <laughs> it's funny, I, I didn't put a picture of it up on here, but have, you, have any of you guys ever seen the pictures or the statues, the, the medieval art of Moses with horns? Anybody ever seen that? Yeah, I mean, one, a couple. Yeah, so there is a statue that Michelangelo, I believe, made, and he's got, Moses is sitting on this little throne with the commandments, and he's got horns, and you're like, What? wait a minute, this doesn't go along with why my belief, what I'm thinking here. But really what it was, was it was a mistranslation for that word that said Moses' face shone. And the Hebrew idea was of beams or pillars shining, radiating. But the word translated into, I want to say, the, the Latin was so close and had the same idea as pillars like beams, which has the same I translation of a word that says horns, literal horns. So there's these pictures, a mistranslation. One little word. Moses has horns. Oh, Lord, help us, right? <laughs> Moses, let me reassure you, Moses had no horns. He had a glow about him because he had been with God, and may we have the same. Amen? Let's all stand together and let's pray out of here. God, we just thank you again this evening for your word, for who you are. God, man, this, Lord, this just pricks me. It just drives me. It pulls me to that place that I want, I want to have this time with you. I want the world to know that you're, you've made me into something new and that you're changing and renewing and, and changing me. As I look into that mirror, that perfect word of God that shows me who you are, I'm being changed into that into your likeness, from glory to glory, by the Holy Spirit. God, work in us, move us, change us, that we would be that salt and that light. And as this world grows darker, the simple truth is, the light's going to be brighter. May we be that. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. God bless you guys.